74 of the Torah 613 commandments or mitzvot in Parsha of Ki These include the laws of the beautiful captive, the inheritance rights of the firstborn, the wayward and rebellious son, burial and the dignity of the dead, returning a lost object, sending away the mother bird before taking the young, and the duty to erect a safety fence around the roof of one's home, and various other forms of kilayim, which are forbidden plants and animal hybrids. Now this is a study that I got from a very well-known website with different texts. And so we're just gonna go through it. This is a test run. Um, so let's begin. This also recounts the judicial procedures and penalties of for adultery, rape, seduction of an unmarried girl and a husband who's falsely accuses his wife of infidelity. The following cannot marry a person of Jewish lineage, a mamzar, someone born from an adulterous or incestuous relationship, a male of a Moabite or a Ammonite descent, a first or second generation Edomite or an Egyptian. Our Parsha also includes laws governing the purity of the military camp, the prohibition against turning in an escaped slave, the duty to pay a worker on time, and to allow anyone working for you, man or animal, to eat on the job, the proper treatment of a debtor, and the prohibition against charging interest on a loan, the law of divorce, from which are derived by many laws of marriage, the penalty of 39 lashes for transgression of a Torah prohibition, and the procedures of Yabum, which is the Leverite marriage of a wife of a deceased childless brother, or the Chalitza, that's removing of the shoe, in the case of the brother-in-law that does not wish to marry her. Kitsetse concludes with the obligation to remember what Amalek did to you on the road on your way out of Egypt. So we're going to then discuss some of the Torah portion. Some of the commandments discussed are very interesting. So in the first Aliyah, first reading, is the section that begins with the discussion regarding female captives of war and lays down the conditions under which soldiers may marry a captive and the firstborn son to a double portion of his father's inheritance is then detailed. This section concludes with the procedures of dealing with an aberrantly rebellious child. Now obviously there's various aliyahs, the second, the third, the fourth, and this goes all the way down to the seventh aliyah, which should lead us to Shabbat. So today we're just going to talk about the first Leo. I thought it was very interesting to go ahead and try to discuss. You know, there's also laws about within the Halacha. There's different studies of Rashi. There's different um, dimensions that we can discuss. And give me a second here, and I can probably find something that we can talk about that may be interesting. Well, this is an interesting that I can read to you. This is a very, in, a very easy mitzvah. Rashi writes in his commentary on verse 7 that sending away the mother bird is a very easy mitzvah to perform, and it occurs and incurs no financial loss. However, this appears to be problematic because, number one, Rashi suggests that in sending away a mother bird, no financial losses is incurred at all. But surely the value of the mother bird itself is a loss. 
In fact, the Mishnah states explicitly, Herlechin 142a, that a small financial loss is incurred when sending a mother bird away. Number two, how can Rashi maintain that sending away the mother bird is an example of one of the easiest mitzvahs of the Torah, when ultimately some of them, some form of physical effort is required? Surely a mitzvah such as the recital of the Shema, which involves merely the uttering of the words, is easier than the act of sending away a mother bird. A further issue here concerns Rashi's explanation on verse 8 as to why the mitzvah of sending the mother bird is followed in the Torah by the mitzvahs of number 1, constructing guardrails on verse 8, not mixing seeds of one's vineyard, verse 9, not plowing a field with two different types of animals, verse 10, not wearing garments made of wool and linen, verse 11, because one mitzvah leads to another. 4. While Rashi does indeed stress the mitzvah of sending away the mother bird will lead to the mitzvah of constructing a guardrail, he then continues, you will then come to possess a vineyard, a field, and fine clothes. Why did Rashi not connect these acquisitions with the mitzvahs they entail? The mitzvah, the mitzvah of not planting mixed seeds, the mitzvah of avoiding mixed plowing, in the midst of avoiding the shatznes. Shatz Here's the explanation. Based on the Talmud maintains that it is a mitzvah that to send the mother away repeatedly, if necessary, in order that she not see her young being taken away. Rashi, however, who limits himself to the literal interpretation of scripture, rejects this idea. For the Torah states explicitly, you should not take the mother upon the young indicating that the prohibition only applies as long as the mother is upon her young. Thus, according to Rashi, when the mother bird returns, as is extremely likely, it would be permissible to take the mother bird too. For at that point, she would not be with her young. Even if one wishes to argue that according to Rashi, this mitzvah is intended to prevent a person from being cruel, and that therefore, the bird would have to be sent away repeatedly. Rashi would maintain that the main cruelty is taking the young from a mother while she is roosting on them. And this is what the Torah wishes to avoid here. And this explanation is quite simple. And it's simply why Rashi wrote in the mitzvah involves no financial losses at all. Because after sending away the mother bird and taking the chicks, the person would still be able to take the mother word as well when she returns a short while later. Number two, at the literal level, this mitzvah is easier than reciting the Shema. Reciting the Shema can sometimes be difficult to carry out. For example, when one is busy with another matter and at the time of the Shema is passing, in contrast, sending away the mother bird is always related to one to what one is doing at the moment, namely collecting birds and eggs. Therefore, this myth is even easier than reciting the Shema, as it is only simple and effortless to perform, and it incurs no financial loss. But furthermore, it always comes at a convenient time. Thirdly, in addition to this physical reward, that's generally speaking, every mitzvah brings, there is also a spiritual reward that one mitzvah leads to another. However, at the literal level, it is only logical that one mitzvah would lead to another if both mitzvahs are similarly in, similar in nature. The mitzvah of sending away a mother bird is clearly similar to the mitzvah of erecting guardrails, since number one, they are both mitzvahs associated with the acquisition of property, new birds, new houses. Both mitzvahs are aimed at saving another creature from pain. Thus Rashi writes in his commentary in verse 8 that the mitzvah of sending away the mother bird only brings physical reward and that you will eventually build a new house. But in addition, it brings the spiritual reward of the mitzvah of constructing a guard realm. However, the mitzvah of sending away the bird is not similar to the laws of planting mixed seed, 
plowing of different types of animals or wearing shat shatnets. Therefore, Rashi could not suggest that a person would come to observe these mitzvot as the result of sending away the mother bird. Nevertheless, the fact that the Torah placed these precepts alongside the others did indicate that Rashi that they are connected in the terms of physical reward. If you have fulfilled the mitzvah of sending away the mother bird, you will then come to possess a vineyard, a field, and fine clothes. So my friends, as you can tell, one simple mitzvah of freeing a mother bird leads to another and leads to another. The simple lesson is, do, do a mitzvah, and it's going to lead to another mitzvah. And before you know it, you're getting closer to meeting all the mitzvahs of the 613 that Hashem has invested in us. Hope this helps you out. Yom Tov. We'll see you soon.